the BBC News at six o'clock with Sophie Rayworth. At six, the first flight taking asylum seekers to Rwanda is due to leave the UK in the next few hours. This is the plane expected to fly them out of a military base in Wiltshire, but only a handful may be on board. We think it's a, a sensible partnership we've set up with Rwanda. Yes, it may, it may take a while uh, to, to get working properly, but it doesn't mean we're not going to keep going. Today, more than 300 people arrived in Dover after they managed to cross the channel illegally in small boats. Will the flights to Rwanda deter people from attempting the dangerous crossing? Also on the programme. Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon kicks off a new campaign for another vote on Scottish independence. A memorial service at Westminster Abbey for the 72 people who died in the Grenfell Tower disaster five years ago today. The Yorkshire seaside town of Whitby votes to restrict the number of second homes for holidaymakers. And he hits it hard. He hits it to the cover point boundary. And a thrilling win for England as they beat New Zealand by five wickets to take the Test Series. Coming up in Sports Day, later in the hour on BBC News, we'll have the latest from the Nations League. Three home nations playing, including Scotland, who are facing Armenia in Yerevan. Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at six from our new studio at Broadcasting House. A flight to Rwanda carrying just a handful of asylum seekers is due to leave the UK tonight after campaigners and charities failed in their bid to block it. It was meant to be taking more than 100 people, but legal challenges mean there will be no more than seven on board, among them Iraqi Kurds and Iranians. The government insists the flights are necessary to deter people trafficking gangs helping thousands cross the channel, but Church of England leaders have called it immoral. Here's our home editor, Mark Easton. The flight to an uncertain future is ready for takeoff. Just a handful of asylum seekers will be forced aboard this evening, seven at most, each with a one-way ticket to Rwanda, a country they've never been to and don't wish to go to. And this is why. Just this morning, more than 300 people arrived in Dover having attempted to cross the channel in small boats. The government brands them illegal migrants, deems them inadmissible for sanctuary in Britain, and in a bid to deter them, threatens them with forcible relocation to East Africa. One of those on today's passenger list is an Iranian Kurd currently held at this immigration detention centre near Heathrow. We spoke to him just before he learned his final appeal against removal had been denied. Since I learned that I am among those to be deported to Rwanda, I hardly can communicate and eat. I can't sleep. I am restless. I prefer die here, not to be transferred to Rwanda. It is shocking. The Prime Minister told the Cabinet this morning that the policy goes ahead, suggesting that lawyers trying to stop the flight were supporting criminals. What the criminal gangs are doing and what the uh, those who, who effectively are abetting the work of the criminal gangs are doing is undermining people's uh, confidence in the safe and legal system, undermining people's general acceptance of, of immigration. Rejecting a last-minute appeal to stop the Rwanda flight, the President of the Supreme Court, Lord Reid, pointedly defended those lawyers who challenged the policy. In bringing that application, the appellant's lawyers were performing their proper function of ensuring that their clients are not subjected to unlawful treatment at the hands of the government. A poll conducted yesterday suggests the Rwanda policy divides Britain. 44% said they supported the idea, 40% opposed it, with the split along party lines. 74% of Tory voters were in favour, 71% of Labour voters were against. In political terms, it's what they call a wedge issue, a policy designed to divide opinion along party lines. And with the Prime Minister's personal popularity within his own party currently low, it's just what Boris Johnson needs right now. 
for whatever reason, migrants are prepared to leave the comparative safety of France to endure perilous journeys to make it to the UK. Unless you're prepared to say, actually, it's not worth it making that journey, you're better off staying in France where you can claim asylum and live a good life there, then migrants will continue to make that journey. But all the bishops in the House of Lords have condemned the Rwanda deal as an immoral policy that shames Britain. It is about the moral principle of saying we are not dealing with this, we are outsourcing it to another nation. Uh, whatever the issues are, go away, your future lives will be sorted out there, not here. That is immoral. A convoy of police vehicles arrived at RAF Boscombe Down this evening to guard the Rwanda aircraft, chartered by the Home Office at an estimated cost of half a million pounds. That's on top of all the government's legal costs, payment to Rwanda for each migrant they accept, and a £120 million aid package. But the government says it's worth the money, even if only one asylum seeker is aboard. Mark Easton, BBC News. The flights to Rwanda are meant to act as a deterrent to those trying to cross the channel in boats. But today, at least 300 more people made that journey. Those are just some of them. Simon Jones reports from Dover. Calm seas mean busy times for the border force, bringing people to Dover after picking them up in the channel. Women and children among today's arrivals, though the vast majority are young men. Hundreds of people achieving their goal today of setting foot on British soil. Well, these are some of the boats that have been used today and in recent days to make the channel crossing. It's clear that the boats have been getting bigger, often packed with up to 40 or 50 people, increasing the risks in the world's busiest shipping lane. I spoke to fisherman Matt Coker, who's been out at sea all day and witnessed the near miss involving a dinghy. We actually watched them go in front of a ship and it was quite, it was quite frightening really how close they got to this ship, which was trying its hardest to avoid them, but obviously the migrant dinghies go in, in all different directions. To try to stop loss of life at sea, the military has now taken operational command in the channel, increasing surveillance, wary though of being accused of becoming a taxi service for migrants. But there appears to be little evidence yet of the so-called Rwanda deterrent, according to groups who support asylum seekers in Kent. From talking to people that have made this journey, they say it wouldn't have acted as a deterrent to then. So I think it's, this is more about, about looking tough, about looking like you're being really tough. Ministers insist it's only once people start arriving in Rwanda that the real deterrent effect will be seen. But for now, the numbers arriving in Dover look set to dwarf the numbers sent to East Africa. Simon Jones, BBC News, Dover. Well, the numbers crossing the channel have more than trebled in the past two years. Close to 29,000 asylum seekers reached these shores by boat last year alone. And just over 15,000 people were offered asylum here last year. Almost four times that number applied, though. In a moment, we'll talk to our political editor, Chris Mason, who's at Westminster. But first, our senior Africa correspondent, Anne Soy, is in the Rwandan capital, Kigali. And, and the authorities have been talking about all this today. What have they been saying? Well, they have been responding to some of the criticisms uh, against this deal. Uh, they said this program is not immoral, uh, neither is it a punishment to send people to live in Rwanda. Uh, we listened to the government spokeswoman, uh, Yolande Makolo, and there was really a sense of pride uh, as she spoke about this program and she seemed to suggest that this is about changing perceptions uh, of Africa. Uh, she said that uh, we hope uh, they'll choose to stay with us and that Africa is not just a, a place of problems but a place of solutions. Uh, now the government says they are ready to receive uh, the asylum seekers. Uh, they will be taken to uh, a hostel uh, that ha up until recently has been uh, the accommodation for uh, some of the survivors of the 1994 uh, Rwandan genocide. And they will be given the first option is to live here. And she has said they will be welcome to take up jobs even within government. Uh, but if they choose to go back to their home countries, the government will facilitate them uh, to, do, to do so. 
The third option is to go to third countries, uh, neither Rwanda nor their home countries. But the government will not initiate that, uh, that, that process. Uh, it will leave it uh, to the asylum seekers uh, to uh, look for uh, countries that can accept them. And once they are accepted, the government can facilitate that. So their claims of asylum will be processed here under Rwandan law and international uh, law. Uh, out in the streets, people, some people do not even know about this, uh, this deal. Um, some of them who know uh, say they, that you know, the asylum seekers are welcome here. This is a country uh, that had so many people living outside the country uh, because of uh, that genocide in 1994. And therefore, they say the asylum seekers are welcome. The opposition, however, has been saying that the government should be concentrating on um, uh, on the problems of Rwandans, um, not solving for, uh, problems from far away. Um, thank you very much. And let's go to Westminster and our political editor, Chris Mason, just a few hours before the flight is supposed to take off. Robust language about this from the Prime Minister. Yeah, absolutely, Sophie. Boris Johnson saying today he'd be willing to consider changing the law to ensure that this policy can work pro properly, given the legal challenges it's encountered. And you speak to people in government and they say, look, anyone who has worked on the the policies surrounding these small small boat crossings in the last couple of years has come to the conclusion they are simply unsustainable. There's been this exponential rise in the last couple of years and governments for the last 20 years or so have tried to grapple for solutions and often with limited success. There's also a distinction to be drawn, I think, here between those with big voices, big opinions and big job titles and a platform from which to articulate them. Think archbishops, think some lawyers, think even, we hear privately, the heir to the throne and public opinion, which is more nuanced. Opinion polls suggesting there is reasonable support for this policy, sometimes more support uh, than uh, opposition and certainly more support amongst Conservative MPs. The government absolutely determined to push ahead with this policy for all of the political problems Boris Johnson faces amongst his own MPs. This is not one of them. Chris, thank you. Scotland's First Minister has launched a fresh push for Scottish independence, insisting there is a strong and compelling case for Scotland to leave the UK. Nicola Sturgeon said she believed the Scottish Parliament had a mandate for a referendum and urged Westminster to respect democracy. Downing Street says now is not the time for another poll and people across Scotland want to see both governments working together. Our Scotland editor, James Cook, reports. Many seasons have rolled by since Scotland rejected independence and the landscape has changed. We've had a pandemic, a cost of living crisis and Brexit, which was rejected by a majority of voters in Scotland. It has affected us in so many different ways. Sally Williams says dragging the nation out of the EU against its wishes has been a disaster. It really boils down to governance and my belief that the Scottish Parliament is the best place to govern Scotland. The damage that's been done by Covid, by Brexit, by everything else, in a funny way is probably the perfect time for us to then get on and build ourselves back out of it, again using our own levers, our own tools. Nicola Sturgeon agrees of course. Her new paper argues that the UK is failing Scotland because comparable countries are richer, happier and more equal. The great question before us is this. If all of these countries can and do use the powers of independence to create wealthier and fairer societies, why not Scotland? But how? The only undisputed route to a referendum is for the Prime Minister to transfer the power to hold one to Holyrood using what's called a Section 30 order. I don't know whether he'll be watching or not, but if he is, I make it clear again, uh, Prime Minister, I stand ready to negotiate a Section 30 order uh, if you decide uh, that you now are a Democrat. There's no sign of the Prime Minister agreeing to that request. He says the Union sees Scotland through tough times. That, by the way, is the firepower of the UK uh, exchequer. That's the, that's the firepower of our, uh, of our single uh, UK uh, Treasury. And I think it's a, it's a great thing. We should keep going with it. It being the 315-year-old union of the nations on either side of this river, a union rooted in commerce. Brexit may have strengthened the political case for independence, the democratic case, but critics say it's weakened the economic argument. They're worried about what would happen to trade across this border. 
if Scotland voted to leave the UK. That's why this gin maker has switched sides. So this is Lin Gin. Ross Jameson voted for independence eight years ago. Do you want to smell it? But now he says he's started a business and sobered up. What does that experience of Brexit tell you about independence for Scotland? I'm a proud Scotsman. I think the idea of independence, you know, if you stand there again, you're know, top of the hill with your kilt, having a wee dram, is brilliant. But the reality of it, especially now through the experience of Brexit, I honestly believe it would be a disaster for the, for the country. But that's far from a settled view in this divided nation. So two things are happening here, a debate about process, about how and when a referendum may or may not be held, and a debate about the substance of the issue, whether or not Scotland would be better off as an independent country. And to be honest, we've not made much progress on the former today, but there has been some significant progress on the latter, because if you consider those issues that I mentioned, Brexit, the pandemic, the cost of living crisis, the war in Ukraine, then what's striking is how much has changed since 2014. And what that means is that politicians on both sides of this debate are scrambling around to find new answers. James Cook, thank you. The time is quarter past six, our top story this evening. The first flight taking asylum seekers to Rwanda is due to leave the UK in the next few hours. And coming up as much of Europe swelters, weather warnings for England and Wales with temperatures set to soar this week. Coming up in Sports Day in the next 15 minutes on the BBC News Channel. She was injured at last year's Wimbledon and has had 12 months out. But Serena Williams will make her singles return at this year's championships. Now, this is the Yorkshire seaside town of Whitby. With its beautiful coastline and beaches, it's a really popular place for holidays. So popular, in fact, that about one in five properties here is now second home or a holiday let. Local residents have had enough. They voted to stop new homes being snapped up for holiday makers. The vote's not legally binding, but residents hope it will make a difference, as Danny Savage has been finding out. Whitby, an ancient town on the coast of North Yorkshire. Hugely popular with tourists, but under these red roofs, it's all getting a bit controversial. Is typically one where people buy to invest. Properties that come on the market here are often being snapped up by people buying a second home. You will find that there's a potential that will go up to best and final offers and traditionally you'll find that um, homeowners will sort of opt to go towards those cash offers. Um, rather than go for a young person with a mortgage. Not many locals left in the town anymore. It's basically all holiday makers and people buying second homes here. 19 year old Katie voted in yesterday's referendum, calling for future new build houses to be for local residents only. It's just so difficult at the moment with people from away coming and buying houses and property. So, what happens when something comes on? It just goes straight away. And obviously, viewings, you ring up and they've had like 20 viewings before they've even come out. The density of holiday homes isn't just confined to the centre of Whitby. This housing area on the outskirts of town also has numerous holiday lets and second homes. We're losing children from our schools, so we're starting to lose funding from the schools. We're losing services on our public transport. Some of the trains have already been taken away and also we're losing people from uh, supplying the local economy. So if we don't have people filling the jobs, we're not going to have any tourism eventually. The authorities say they are listening. There is now a proposal for new build homes to be for local residents only. I think the future is brighter because we are now talking about it. Whereas if we weren't talking about it, it was people just putting their head in the sand. Sold to locals may soon become more common here. Danny Savage, BBC News, Whitby. There are 1.3 million job vacancies in the UK now, a new record high. The rise is mainly down to older workers who've chosen to retire early during the pandemic. The Chancellor said the UK's jobs market remains robust, but Labour has accused the government of utter complacency about the high number of people choosing not to work. Today's new figures also show how pay rises are falling behind soaring inflation. While our economics editor Faisal Islam is here to talk us through the figures. Yeah, well, Sophie, it's a bit of a mixed picture. 
The good news is that unemployment is close to historic lows, reflecting the success of pandemic support measures at 3.8%, one of the lowest levels in half a century. But the smallest signs that it's starting to tick back up again in the very latest data. However, take a look at this. Vacancies in the economy hit another record, this time above 1.3 million, more than the population of Birmingham, with hundreds of thousands of missing workers reflecting those retiring during the pandemic, long-term ill and fewer European workers post-Brexit under new immigration rules. Now, this is the consequence of a rebound from the pandemic. The impact of all that is becoming material, contributing to visible problems at our airports, in NHS hospital waiting rooms and in our cleaning companies too. There are around 200,000 unfilled cleaning vacancies and now more workers from abroad are required, says this cleaning company boss. We believe we're around 15% down. I would describe it as a crisis because the simple fact is it's getting worse. There simply isn't enough staff to go around. So in that regard, we really need to sit with government and look at all opportunities to, 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 to bring people into the country. If we don't, then you're running the risk that standards reduce and reduce. While some of these pressures have helped push up cash wages, for those in jobs, a very sharp squeeze is on. On average, wage rises seem quite strong, up 6.8% on the year. Strip out bonuses, mainly though not exclusively in the banking sector, and we're down to just over 4%. But then apply inflation to get the real terms increase, and it's almost wiped out, close to zero growth in total pay. And without bonuses, it's down 2.2% in real terms, the lowest figure for a decade, and significantly less than that for public sector workers. So the jobs figures showing workers in high demand, but high inflation watering down the value of wage rises. Faisal Islam, BBC News. The airline industry and the government must both shoulder the responsibility for the recent chaos seen at airports. That's what MPs have been told today. The head of the consumer group, which told a Commons committee that staff shortages had been underestimated, leading to thousands of flight cancellations and long queues at airports. Our transport correspondent Katie Austin can explain more. Katie. Yes, Sophie. While most people have got away without major problems, you'll probably have seen pictures of long queues at some airports since before Easter and heard about flight cancellations. So far in June, more than 900 flights leaving the UK have been cancelled, most of them in advance, and EasyJet has had the highest number. There have been various reasons for disruption, and problems are happening elsewhere in Europe too, but aviation staff shortages are a big underlying factor. The industry shed many jobs during the pandemic, including 30,000 at airlines. Some firms have now struggled to hire enough new recruits in time for the rising demand. It's not all about cabin crew. Ground workers like baggage handlers are in short supply, and that was given as a reason for the tour operator TUI cancelling dozens of flights from Manchester this month. Here's what they said today. We needed to be confident we could operate and that the baggage system in particular at Manchester was one of the primary causes for, for the delay because the, the bags couldn't be loaded before the crew went out of hours because there was such a delay in loading the bags. We learnt our lesson, we're building more resilience in terms of things that we can influence. Experts say hiring challenges are down to people having left the sector for other jobs, fewer European workers around post-Brexit, and it's an extremely competitive labour market. And once you've signed someone up, you have to get them security clearance. A representative of British Airways, which has cut 10% from its schedule until October, said today 3,000 new hires were still in the referencing process, and it was taking up to 140 days to get people through. Swissport, which does baggage handling for TUI and others, said it was not not far off its recruitment target now, but it was taking 60 to 90 days to get people an airside pass. The airport's trade body has said some people quit while waiting to start the job. The system is speeding up a little bit, um, but there certainly were delays and it took much longer um, when we, you know, recruitment really kicked in. So we do, as airports, uh, you know, there are still, I would say, several hundreds of people who are still awaiting that final clearance. 
Today, MPs asked aviation firms if issues would be fixed and everything would run to plan this summer. None of them could give a guarantee. But the aviation regulator and the Department for Transport jointly wrote to airlines today asking them to check their summer schedules were deliverable and to ensure consumers are dealt with properly when disruption does happen. Sophie. Katie, thank you. A service has been held at Westminster Abbey to remember the 72 men, women and children who died in the Grenfell Tower fire five years ago today. Church leaders described the loss and anguish suffered as still vivid and sharp. Other events to mark the anniversary have included a 72-second silence and a multi-faith service at the foot of Grenfell Tower itself. Our Home Affairs correspondent Tom Simons reports. Today, a scattered community returned to the foot of their tower. Along with the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, in several events, they remembered the loss of 72 lives. Even five years on, survivors ask, how can this have happened? Whole families lost, like the El Wahhabis. Abdelaziz El Wahhabi was on the phone to his sister, who escaped until the last minute. He wanted me to reassure his son that it was going to be okay. So I said, yes, it's going to be okay. And that's something I've got to live with because I told him it was going to be okay and it wasn't. Ed Daffan also escaped with his life. His group, Grenfell United, has said change needs to follow the loss of so many lives. I've always said that, you know, Grenfell was a tragedy in three acts, you know, the way we were treated before, the events of the night and what happened afterwards. If there had been some criminal convictions, if people that lived in social housing were never going to be treated the way that we were treated, if there was no one going to bed at night with the same cladding as Grenfell on their buildings, that would be something. But none of that has happened and that's why it's so painful. The Grenfell Public Inquiry has identified the council, corporate and government failings which combined to cause the fire. And the police appear confident they have too. I, like others, have heard some of the evidence and I don't know what the best word to describe it. Um, I've sometimes been shocked at what I've heard. But what I can say is there is nothing which is being heard of the public inquiry which we, from our criminal investigation perspective, are not already aware of. Only when the public inquiry produces its final report will criminal charges even be considered. Many in this area believe that the tower should stay exactly as it is until people go to prison. Take a seat over here, madam. Take a seat over here. The wait is affecting the healing process. Antonio escaped the fire and now runs a vaccination centre, but... There is not one single day in my life where Grenfell is not present in my life. As companies and organisations involved accuse each other of blame, he says... Don't try to hide anything. What you did wrong, let it out. Don't try to justify what is not justifiable. Because people here say this is not over until justice is done. Tom Simons, BBC News at Grenfell Tower. And you can see a special programme called Grenfell Has Anything Changed? It's available now on the BBC iPlayer and at bbc.co.uk forward slash iPlayer or via the iPlayer app on your smart device. It's not often that England cricket captain Ben Stokes is outshone, but today on the final day of the second test against New Zealand, Johnny Bairstow did just that, hitting a sparkling century to seal an unlikely victory at Trent Bridge. Andy Swiss has been watching all the action. It was free entry at Trent Bridge and they flocked in their thousands. England fans of every age, every hairstyle, hoping for a few heroics. Could their team conjure a dramatic victory? Well, first they had to bowl out New Zealand. It took a little while, but job done and game on. England have bowled New Zealand out. That meant England needed 299 to win, but their hopes seemed to be fading as New Zealand took four early wickets, including talisman Joe Root. But just when England needed something special, enter Johnny Bairstow with a display of brutal, quite breathtaking brilliance. He clobbered New Zealand to all corners of Nottingham in a truly staggering display, reaching his century in just 77 balls, the second fastest test hundred ever by an Englishman and the innings of Bairstow's life. And at the other end, Ben Stokes was doing what Ben Stokes does, one of the biggest sixes you'll ever see as he defied a leg injury to thrash his way to 50. It was mayhem. 
By the time Bairstow fell for an incredible 136, Trent Bridge rose as one, a moment they and he will never forget. And moments later, Stokes blazed his team to glory. Victory for England's new captain and with it the series, the perfect end to one of cricket's most dazzling days. Yes, I think the fans here are still pinching themselves. A quite remarkable win for England, thanks to that remarkable innings by Johnny Bairstow. And remember, England had really been struggling in test matches, but their new era under Ben Stokes is off to a brilliant start, Sophie. It certainly is, Andy. Thank you. Time for a look at the weather now. Matt Taylor is here and it is going to get hot, hot, hot this week, isn't it? For a it lot is. of people but not for everyone. It's a bit of an un uneven weather story this uh, week, uh, Sophie. Yes, today we've had skies like this one, captured by one of the weather watchers in Powys, across much of England and Wales. It's been a different story, though, in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Skies much similar to these in the Highlands. And that contrast is going to continue through the rest of this week with uh, cloud and some rain at times for Scotland and Northern Ireland, whereas England and Wales, with the sunshine, comes increasing heat and increasing humidity. So why? It's this air of high pressure here to the south and east. As that works its way eastwards, we're going to draw up the air from Spain and France, whereas to Scotland, Northern Ireland, closer to areas of low pressure, rain will swing through, as it will do at times tonight. It'll be on and off. It won't be there all night long. Clear skies for England and Wales. Good view of the supermoon, of course, which peaked today. But here, the coolest of the conditions. Maybe not quite as chilly as last night, but temperatures in single figures to start Wednesday. For Wednesday, though, England, Wales, largely sunny start. Bit of low cloud drifting around these coasts later on. An isolated shower. But for Scotland, Northern Ireland, like today, plenty of cloud. Best of the brighter breaks to the south and the east. Further rain at times in the, the highlands, down into Northern Ireland. Probably a few more showers here than we saw through today. Temperatures generally in the mid to high teens. But look, we're starting to build that heat towards the south and east. 27 the high in London. And pollen levels shooting up for all, including Scotland and Northern Ireland, moderate to high levels here. Then into Thursday, it's a case of spot the difference. Uh, more showers for Northern Ireland and uh, parts of Western Scotland, maybe some longer spells of rain. A uh, fair bit of hazy sunshine for England and Wales, temperatures widely into the mid 20s. But uh, the, the nights are going to get in hotter and more humid as well. So, rather uncomfortable start to Friday, a day of heavier rain across Scotland and Northern Ireland. But for England and Wales, in the sunshine, we'll see temperatures for some eastern areas at around 30 to 33 degrees. A very hot day indeed. Wow, Matt, thank you very much. I'm going to head over here now because that is it from the BBC News at six on Tuesday, the 14th of June. You can, of course, keep up to date with all the latest developments on the BBC website. Uh, from the six team, it is goodbye, but the news continues right here on BBC One because it's now time to join our colleagues across the nations and regions for the news where you are. Goodbye.